So before we get started again, quick announcement. That is that the biology department seminar this week, tomorrow at noon, is small scale physical worlds of gelatinous zooplankton. Uh, this is Dr. Kelly Sutherland, who I believe is at UFO, but I'm not absolutely certain. And I'm hoping that she's going to talk a little bit about uh, particle capture, i.e., the most interesting particles ever, which are viruses. Exactly. So um, we shall see. I'm not exactly certain what you'll be talking about, but it should be, should be a lot of fun and certainly. Predator-prey interactions is also something you can think about from a virus point of view. I also noticed that I managed to forget to bring my model today, so you just need to visualize the model up here, my DNA model. So I'm sure you can all do that um, very well here. So, um, but beforehand, just a quick review in terms of what we're talking about, and again, with this particular model. Um, today we're going to talk about mostly DNA binding proteins and a little bit about transcriptional regulation in bacteria. But the sort of main take home message here today is really going to be all about the major groove and about dimeric proteins. And one of the reasons that I wish I had brought my model is if you think about where you have two major grooves right next to each other. So here's a major groove. There's a major groove. All of us remember the data that Watson and Crick stole from Rosalind Franklin. Yeah? Yes? Um, about the dimensions of DNA, that it's you know, 10 nucleotides per turn. There are about 34 um, angstroms between the two. And so what that means is these are about 35, sorry, not angstroms, but nanometers apart, each of these two. And that will become um, important later on. And, particularly if you think about dimers, so two proteins binding usually in these what we call adjacent major groups. So last time I ran out of time. I didn't notice it was already 10.05 and everybody was leaving. Sorry about that. Uh, but <laughs> the message here really is that the interactions that happen with the DNA model, which we're imagining right here, um, in the major groove of DNA are going to be multiple weak interactions that are happening there. Hydrogen bonds are just one of those kinds of weak interactions. You're also going to have some ionic interactions. Those, of course, are not as specific in terms of those interactions. But you can also have hydrophobic interactions. What kind of hydrophobic interactions do you expect in the major groove? What are those going to be interacting with? Not so much the backbone, but there's one specific thing in here that hopefully there's a methyl group hanging out here on the thymidine. So you can also have hydrophobic interactions happening in the major group of DNA. So side chains could be interacting with all of those. And this is just an example here on the right hand side. We have various different amino acids just listed through here, each of these numbers. We've got arginines, threonines, lysines, uh, We've got asparagines, and look, isoleucine, isoleucine, highly hydrophobic. What's it interacting with? Thymidine. Surprise, surprise. So um, these are just one example of how we have multiple different amino acid side chains interacting with the bases in the major groove. And also, as someone mentioned here in answer to one of my earlier questions, you also have interactions with the backbone as well. Those are particularly going to be those ionic interactions because highly charged due to those phosphates. So multiple different interactions here. And as I mentioned last time, we're getting better at designing DNA binding proteins with the appropriate amino acids to put them into the right place in your double-stranded DNA. But it's still really hard to do that and where you know, people have great ideas and great designs and then it ends up not working terribly well. Base pairing interactions are a heck of a lot easier way to go and we'll talk about regulation due to those kinds of interactions, again, mostly RNA, um, a little bit later on. But what's, what's making all of these interactions? How are we putting them together? You may also notice here that if you just look at the numbers here, so this is asparagine 51 and threonine 6. Now, that's relative to where they are in that amino acid sequence. 
So they're really very separate in the amino acid sequence, but are right next to each other in terms of how they're interacting with the DNA. So that tells you that there's lots of other structure which is important in terms of getting this. Yeah, it's just not a lot of linear stretch of amino acids which are going to be interacting um, with your DNA. So let's look at some of these ways. And I hopefully haven't beaten the dead horse on this too much. But, and again, should have my model. But you can imagine my model and imagine my arm is an alpha helix. Um, it turns out it fits perfectly into the major groove of DNA. So one of the major paradigms in thinking about how proteins interact with DNA has to do with alpha helices, and we'll see a little bit later on, two beta sheets sitting in the major groove of DNA. Now, why is that happening? Think about where those side chains are. In alpha helices, they're sticking out all the way around the outside. So you put the alpha helix in there, all those side chains are sticking out around it. If you think about beta sheets, what is happening? The amino acids are pointing away from the backbone on those beta sheets, so also can interact in the major groove of DNA. So probably the most common of these DNA binding motifs, and again, as a reminder, a motif is a stretch of amino acids that by itself doesn't form a structure, so it's got to be part of a domain. But that piece in and of itself, looking at it, you can get an idea of what the function is. And so classically, and we're going to talk today about DNA binding motifs and dimerization motifs. So this particular DNA binding motif is called the helix turn helix. Wow, what an amazing name. Um, but it really does describe quite nicely what goes on here. You have an alpha helix, a couple of amino acids between this first alpha helix and the second alpha helix, and the red one conveniently labeled here is the recognition helix. That's the alpha helix that sits down in the major group of DNA, and all those side chains are interacting with the individual nucleotides in the major groove. And the other helix basically just sits on top of it, holds it in, and in some cases this first helix will also have some ionic interactions with the backbone, as you can see here quite nicely. Now, why do we spend so much time talking about helix turn helix DNA binding motifs? Because the vast majority of DNA binding proteins have something very similar to this. And this was best known from studying bacterial transcriptional regulators. And as we'll see a little bit later on, also find it in a lot of eukaryotic transcriptional regulators for a while. And it turns out this used to be the paradigm. Everyone thought that DNA was bound by an alpha helix in the major groove of DNA. Uh, and one thing is, again, as a reminder here, if you think about double-stranded DNA, again, two major grooves, 34 angstroms or 3.4 nanometers apart relative to each other. One of these alpha helices sits in a major groove here. If you have a dimer, the other alpha helix is going to fit into the major groove here. And these are four different proteins here. Now, these are proteins. They're not just the domains. The domains are highlighted in red and blue. Recognition helix here in red. The helix first part, helix turn helix right here. And again, many, many, many of these are dimeric proteins. We even looked at the lambda crow protein earlier on. So classic, and again, probably the most common of the DNA binding motifs of this helix turn helix, which are parts of other proteins. There are, you'll notice again this whole um, idea of two major, two adjacent major grooves. Why is that the case? Well, if you just think about how many nucleotides, or I should say base pairs, one alpha helix is going to be able to interact with in a particular major groove, that's going to be on the order of about six nucleotides. If you just think about the size of genomes, six nucleotides with a particular sequence is going to occur at random relatively frequently in your genome. And you can do the math, figure out exactly what it is. Um, so if you have just a particular protein, which is only going to bind to six nucleotides, it's going to bind in a whole bunch of different places in your genome. And that's probably not a really good thing if you're thinking about these as regulations of transcription, et cetera. So you want to have specificity. And one of the easiest ways to get specificity is to have just two of these proteins that interact with each other that now, instead of binding to six nucleotides, actually bind to 12 nucleotides. And the chance that you have 12 nucleotides in exactly the same position in your genome is much, much, much less likely. So 
This is the case for the lambda crow protein. Interested in what crow stands for? Take the virology course next term. Um, but this is that binding site that it binds to. So 5 prime AACAC, just five nucleotides in this case. And then on the opposite strand, in an inverted repeat structure, AACAC. So this dimeric protein, the dimer is supposed to be shown here where these two are interacting with each other. It's not binding to these black nucleotides. It's just binding to, it's not just these nucleotides here, but the base pairs here. So we have five nucleotides here, five nucleotides here in an inverted orientation. And what that means is those dimers, just a second, Dan, I'll get right back to you, um, is that these monomers are interacting with each other in either a head to a head or tail to tail interaction. What that means is they're just going to be dimers. If you had a head to tail interaction, you could have dimer, trimer, tetramer, et cetera. So head to head or tail to tail enforces that these are just dimers that are interacting there. Yeah, Damon, your question. So the, the green bases on here are just the recognition site, as we would call it, or in this case, the half site. AACAC is going to be a half site, and then related by this inverted symmetry here. Um, these actually represent the base pairs. So this really should be the green on both strands. So it should be AT, AT, CG, AT, CG. Us molecular biologists are lazy, so we just draw one strand and say what that is. But by assumption, it's always binding to double-stranded DNA, so we'll have that other strand as well. Other questions on this? This is an important concept that somehow I do a bad job of explaining, at least based on how people do on exams afterwards. Yes, in back. Yeah, so the, the dyad symmetry, again, just to repeat this, people didn't hear that, refers to those binding sites, each of those half sites, which are then related by a twofold axis of symmetry right here in the middle. Yeah? So are the, um, the motifs parts of these dimers? Yeah, so the question are the parts of these dimers. So here, the motif, your DNA binding motif, and we well, can back up here really quickly. This is lambda crow <laughs> right here. So this motif, this alpha helix right here, is going to be binding to the major groove right here on the top part. That same alpha helix now symmetrically in the opposite orientation, again, the dyad symmetry that you were just asking about, is over here. This now will bind over on this side. So the question is, why dimers and not, oh, I'll call them just higher order oligomers? Um, one is that it's a lot easier to have dimers, because you've just got that same interaction zone. And if you look here, um, the dyad symmetry is present in the binding site, but it's also present here in the protein. And so that's really straightforward. If you have something like a trimer, how you have those associations are going to be slightly more complicated relative to each other, and you could have them sort of as in a ring structure, and we saw that in PCNA and some of these other proteins before, but it starts to get much more complicated. And dimers are really quite straightforward, and we'll see another reason why dimers in just a second. Yeah? So more complex, you actually have higher specificity. So assuming that you've got multiple of these DNA binding motifs, you could actually get higher and higher specificity. The more you get, the higher specificity you have. Pardon? It's a little bit harder to do. The other thing is that if you have a huge number of these specific bindings, you're actually going to have very, very tight binding. And one of the important things is you want to turn these things on and off sometimes. And so if you have too tight binding, it's not going to come off very easily. OK, so <clears throat> that's, again, the most common are these helix turn helix. You find them in almost all bacterial systems, few exceptions. Um, some eukaryotic systems, and then there's sort of an extension to that that people find in eukaryotic systems because eukaryotes have to have a different name for everything. Um, I just call this the eukaryotic helix turn helix, but 
the eukaryotic people in our textbook calls it a homeo domain. Again, all it is is a alpha helix, and again the red alpha helix here, sitting in the major group of DNA. And now instead of having just one helix stacked on top of it, it has two helices stacked on top of it. Now, homeo domain, and this should tell you immediately something that's a little bit different relative to motifs. What's that homeo domain? What's domain mean relative to motif? It has stable structure. So that domain, these three helices together, actually have a stable structure. The other aspect about homeo domains is different relative to helix turn helixes that if you look at the very end of this extra helix, which is there, so you could also call this a helix helix turn helix, um, has specific interactions in the minor group of DNA. So it's not only the major group of DNA, but in some cases you also have the minor group of DNA as well. Another common motif in terms of binding to DNA, and this one I particularly like because just by looking at the amino acid sequence, you can usually guess that one of these things is here. They're called zinc fingers. Why are they called zinc fingers? Because if you draw them out like this, uh, they give this sort of finger structure. You could say it's something else as well. Um, binding to a zinc ion. And one of the questions that my undergraduate molecular biology instructor asked me is, can a zinc finger get caught in a leucine zipper? which is a very fun question. You can think about that a little bit later. But um, the zinc finger, basically this binding to zinc happens through interactions with some pretty rare amino acids, particularly these cysteines. So this cysteine XX cysteine, XX just means any amino acid here, cysteine XX cysteine. Finding four cysteines together in an amino acid sequence of a protein is very, very rare. And so if you just see these four cysteines or two cysteines and two histidines together, you can make a pretty good prediction that that's likely to be binding zinc. And in most of those cases, it's going to be forming a zinc finger. What do zinc fingers do? Again, this structure we now know quite well is making an alpha helix. Where does that alpha helix fit into? The major groove of DNA. But instead of having that other helix packing on it, it's now got either a couple of beta strands, or it turns out that there you can have some alpha helices associated with it as well. So these are two kinds of zinc fingers. Um, but again, the major thing here is that you're putting an alpha helix into the major groove of DNA through this interaction. Yeah, Damon. So these are very common in eukaryotic systems. You find them rarely in bacteria and sometimes also in archaea as well. Uh, but very common in eukaryotic systems, and we're going to spend quite a long time talking about these nuclear hormone receptors, um, which have these specific zinc finger interactions. And zinc fingers turn out to be a case where you can often have these multimers that are not just dimers. You can have three or four or five of these zinc fingers all put together. Um, and you find that, we'll see that in a, an example in just a second here. As I mentioned before, People always thought, well, until when I was in graduate school in the late dark ages, um, that all specific DNA interactions were these alpha helices sitting in major grooves, which is you know, what we're just talking about until now. And again, while I was in graduate school, and this was in the early 90s, um, people determined the structure of this protein right here. This is the methionine repressor. Um, and it had these really nice alpha helices right here, 3.4 nanometers apart. So obviously, this is where they bound to DNA, right? No, it binds over here on this side, where the two beta strands are. Um, and interestingly enough, a postdoc who was working in the lab where I did my PhD said, when the structure came out, they said, oh, it binds over here. He said, no way, that's not true, um, because we have mutants, which get rid of DNA binding, and those mutants are over here. So. Clearly, it's actually what's going on here. This is relatively rare, but two beta strands, it turns out, fit into the, alpha, into the major group of DNA just as well as an alpha helix does. And so you can also have binding this way. So it's not just these alpha helices. Um, protein P53, which you may or may not have heard of if you're taking cell biology, you've probably heard about this ad nauseum. 
you're taking cancer biology next term, you're going to hear a lot more about this protein, uh, also binds through these beta strands um, sitting in the major groove of DNA. So now I need to switch gears a little bit. Again, we talked about dimers. One of the questions is, how do you get dimer formation? And this is a place where most textbooks, I think, are wrong. Um, and you know, usually I say believe the textbook. This time I say believe me instead. Um, because what I want to talk about now is really dimerization motifs and not DNA binding motifs. And these are two images that come from the DNA binding motif part of our chapter. They're really proteins that are made up of two different motifs. They've got dimerization motifs, which you have up here above the DNA, and DNA binding motifs, which are down here binding to the DNA. So mentioned before, and again in the case of the MET repressor, you've got these alpha helices, which are separated by exactly the right amount to fit in the major groove of DNA, or two adjacent major grooves. Here instead, you have the major groove, which is basically extended, and you look at the major groove here, kind of like scissors fitting into the major groove of DNA. Again, imagine my model and two arms sticking into here. These are usually alpha helices that have large numbers of very basic amino acids. Why basic amino acids? What's the charge of basic amino acids? Positive. What are they going to interact with? The phosphates um, on the backbone of DNA. So this particular kind of protein, which also turns out to be quite common in transcriptional regulators, and particularly in eukaryotes, um, people call a basic, so a basic helix with a leucine zipper. So leucine zippers we talked about before. These are where you have every seven amino acids, a large hydrophobic amino acid, usually leucine, but isoleucine, phenylalanine, some of these other hydrophobic amino acids can get you dimerization where these two alpha helices are basically just wrapping around each other and interacting because of these large hydrophobics on either side. There's also a dimerization domain quite common in eukaryotic transcriptional regulators, which is the helix loop helix. So helix loop helix, very often connected to a basic helix, which is a DNA binding part. But just helix loop helix up here is sufficient for dimerization, just like the leucine zipper part is sufficient for dimerization, but it's not sufficient for DNA binding. You have to have these basic helices that are attached to them. And in many cases, again, these are really long alpha helices, these full of leucines, these ones that have lots of basic residues that are associated with them. So why do we beat on dimerization motifs so much? Well, partly it's because we talked about with Crow, you've got these dimers that are associating binding to individual half sites. So it gives you much more specificity. But there's another reason that dimers are so useful. And that is you can mix and match individual monomers in dimers. So you end up with what we call heterodimers. And the really nice thing about heterodimers is basically outlined down here at the bottom. If you have one of these basic leucine zipper proteins, we've got dark green and light green. This dark green homodimer binds to one site, shown here in blue. The light green heterodim oh, sorry, homodimer is going to bind to the red sites. But you can have a heterodimer, which now binds to blue and red. And these are now different sequences relative to each other. So each of the homodimers is going to bind to a particular site. And the heterodimer is going to bind to a different DNA binding site. And so just being able to mix and match these proteins, if they've got a dimerization domain like we have here with these leucine zippers, this leucine zipper doesn't know that it's interacting with the same DNA binding motif or a different DNA binding motif. The, that dimerization motif is just a dimerization motif. And so mixing and matching um, allows you to have much more possibilities in terms of places to bind rather than just one specificity. So another reason to have dimers is you can do this mixing and matching process. So not just having the higher specificity. So getting back to your question. Uh, turns out that this happens in multiple different ways. But we'll talk a little bit more about MAD alpha um, and MAD A. These are two dimeric proteins that actually have very different DNA binding motifs. This one's got a classic homeodomain. This one's a very different protein here. Um, you also can have 
multiple different DNA binding domains in the same protein. Um, this is another one that we'll talk about a little bit later on, which we have a homeodomain and a different DNA binding motif that is also binding to DNA. So this is getting back to your question about dimers, trimers, tetramers, et cetera. You can actually have multiple DNA binding motifs in one protein. And this is often what happens with our uh, leucine zippers. So you have multiple leucine zippers in a single protein, in a monomer. And that can then bind highly specifically to um, these sites that are all next to each other. Let's look at some of these DNA binding sites in a little bit more detail. Uh, one of the things that I sort of keep mentioning, oh, these things are binding to specific sites. Well, if you think about the <coughs> chemicals, again, exactly what the hydrogen bond donors, acceptors, hydrophobic interactions in the major groove are, and all of the various different amino acids, turns out that most of these DNA binding proteins will bind to lots of different sequences, some better than others. And what that means is you don't have you know, one protein binding to one particular site. You've got one protein binding to some sites more and some sites less. And one way of looking at that is like we, have we talked about this or did Dr. Bartlett, I think? Well, we talk about consensus sequences. So a consensus sequence here would be TAA, TTGC. And this turns out to be the binding site for a protein called Nanog that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, so your consensus sequence is going to be TAA, TTGC. And that means that Nanog is going to bind best to this site, but it can also bind to CAA, TTGC, or all of these various different combinations, but always at nucleotide 2 and 3, it will be binding to A on one strand, and of course this is actually the other strand as well. This is always a double-stranded piece of DNA that it's binding to. So, this is the binding site that your particular protein is going to be interacting with. Here's our nanog protein binding to this particular sequence. Now again, we can have a monomer binding to this sequence. This is now seven nucleotides still, particularly if you're thinking about this in a eukaryotic genome, you're going to find seven nucleotide sequences all over the darn place, particularly if it can bind to some of these other sequences as well. Um, so here you almost are required to have a dimer in terms of getting your specificity and then also you can have heterodimers to get slightly different specificities. The blue and green now are going to bind to different particular sequences. But there's another reason that you have dimers, not just this different specificity. And that is if you have dimers that can <coughs> dissociate when they're not bound to DNA. And so the idea here is that if you have a protein that's always a dimer, in this case a heterodimer, but it doesn't really matter what we're talking about here. This could be a single protein or a heterodimer. If this is always a heterodimer, it's always going to bind to one of these sequences. Uh, these sequences, by the way, are known as the cis regulatory elements. We talked about that last time. It just means they're next to whatever they're regulating in the genome. So binds this cis regulatory element, but if you just look at how this binding takes place, as you increase protein concentration, you're going to get an exponential increase in the fraction of each of these individual cis regulatory elements that are bound to this particular protein. And this works fine in some cases if you can change protein concentration from a very low amount to a very high amount very rapidly, because usually you want to turn something on or turn something off. If it's just sort of halfway here, that's a little bit of a drag, because you don't know whether it's going to be on or off in any particular case. So the way that biology seems to have dealt with this is that you have the individual monomeric proteins that just by themselves don't bind terribly well to DNA, and will only bind very well to DNA when they've come together as dimers, and this dimerization happens preferentially on the DNA. This is also what's called cooperative binding. We talked about cooperative binding a little bit earlier. We talked about single-stranded DNA binding proteins. Once you get one bound, it's really easy to bind the next one. If you have this dual equilibrium, where you, also, where you have monomer-dimer equilibrium, hang on, we'll get to that in just a second. You can get your clickers out now, because you know. Uh, if you have this equilibrium, where you have mostly monomers and some dimers, and dimers bind really well to DNA, but monomers don't, you end up with, instead of this exponential curve, what's called a sigmoidal curve, 
And what this means is that lower protein concentrations, you have basically no binding at these sites. And at higher concentrations, you have complete binding. This is much more like a switch, turning something on, turning something off. And this is much more useful in terms of gene regulation. Something, you want to turn something on, you want to turn something off, rather than have a little bit on, a little bit off, um, and very dependent on these particular low protein concentrations. Because changing the concentration of your proteins, as we talked about last time, the actual concentration, you know, your transcription, you've got to transcribe it, you've got to get that messenger RNA process, you've got to get it out of the nucleus, you blah, 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 blah. So it takes a long time to change protein concentrations. And here, the uh, minimal changes in protein concentrations or affinity can go from no binding to a lot of binding. Yeah? So the consensus sequence is that's where you're going to have the tightest binding. Uh, but you'll have other cases where it's not binding as well, but it still will bind. And particularly in a case like this one, where you're only going to get good binding if you have dimers, you have a weak binding site, something that's not that close to the consensus, you're only going to get binding when you have a dimer or something like that. So it plays into these, some of these sigmoidal curves, yes. OK, more questions on this? Now we can get to our clicker question, finally. I know, something we've all been waiting for. Uh, <clears throat> dimeric HTH just stands for helix turn helix. Sorry if I didn't mention that before. Um, containing proteins often have their recondition helices about, and this would actually be 3.4 nanometers, not 34 nanometers. Sorry about that. Apparently so that they can act as leucine zippers, form heterodimers, bind cooperatively, bind adjacent major grooves, bind adjacent major, minor and major groups. I only had my DNA model here. That would make it so much easier, wouldn't it? Vote early, vote often. Talk to your neighbors. Figure out what they were thinking about. <clears throat> Ten. Five, still working on that 100%. We're not quite there yet, but we're doing well. So yes, it's the adjacent major grooves in the DNA, so that you have both of those alpha helices fitting in there. Um, and very often, you can identify these half sites by just looking 10 base pairs away from each other. Now, I should have shown that on when I showed the dyad symmetric sites. But if you look at the centers of those sites, they're almost always exactly 10 nucleotides apart, because that's as long as you take to get around the double helix. So yes, D is the answer, just in case we were wondering. <laughs> OK, <clears throat> this is great if you happen to have nice, straight Watson and Crick formed DNA with a nice model. But as we all know, for eukaryotic systems, most of that DNA is not in a nice, straight, B-formed DNA. It's mostly associated with nucleosomes. So nucleosomes are great because they compact the DNA, but they're really kind of a drag because if you have a specific DNA binding protein that you want to associate with this particular nucleosome, it can be a real problem. So we talked about nucleosome breathing when we talked about chromatin earlier on the breathing that allows various different proteins to associate with that DNA. Turns out that if you have one of these sequences that is towards the outside of a nucleosome, this can be bound pretty easily. And yeah, about 1 20th of the time, this sequence can be bound by a specific DNA binding protein. So here it's not so much of a problem. On the other hand, so this is just looking at this, you look at one of these DNA binding proteins, it can bind to this sequence um, really pretty well, but not quite as well as if you don't have chromatin brown template. On the other hand, if your specific DNA binding sequence is right in the middle of the nucleosome, it's actually pretty hard to get to this. 
And so how do you deal with all of these nucleosomes? When you think about chromatin, heterochromatin, what would be a really good way to allow access to that particular piece of DNA? Pardon? Chromatin remodeling complexes, exactly. Moving the DNA relative to the nucleosomes. So if you remember when we talked about the pre-initiation complex, looking at all the things that are present at a eukaryotic promoter, one of the things which is there are nucleosome remodeling complexes. This is part of the RNA polymerase complex that sits down at a promoter. So that's one of the major things that's happening. Another thing that happens is it turns out that cooperative binding with these two monomers stimulating binding by dimers also helps. And so basically what happens is you have a single regulator that binds to this piece of DNA, which is part of the breathing part that comes on and off quite frequently. Once you have association of that protein to the DNA, it will help the binding of a second protein because you started to pull that piece of DNA off of the nucleosome. The second piece comes off and also this interaction between the two proteins um, is stronger than the interaction between the DNA and the nucleosome itself. So cooperative binding also helps a lot with dealing with these nucleosome trans um, bound templates or what you're going to be using to have your transcription taking place on. So we'll talk more about nucleosomes and nucleosome rearrangements as we talk more about how you get transcription or regulation a little bit later on. But I wanted to take a bit of an aside here and talk about how we know what a consensus sequence is and how we know what a DNA binding protein is. And this brings me to some methods and I actually vaguely thought about doing these methods in the very first lecture of the term. It's totally different than the way the textbook has it, but uh, there are some reasons for doing it this way and reasons for doing it the other way. So this is really getting to that question about you know, consensus sequences. How do we know what a consensus sequence is? How do we know what a DNA binding protein is? And so there are lots of different ways of doing this, and I'm going to go through a few of them in the next few slides here. The first one is what's called a band shift or electrophoretic mobility shift assay. And so what we're looking at here, and this is a real example down here at the bottom, this is the cartoon form that we have here. You have a piece of DNA, and very often this is going to be a promoter DNA. So you have a piece of DNA which you want to figure out what proteins bind to this particular piece of DNA. First you need to show that you have some proteins that are binding to this piece of DNA, and that's what's cartooned right here. You have your piece of DNA. This piece of DNA, if you separate it from all of the other DNAs, and all this is doing is separating based on size. So the size of the DNA in the absence of any proteins that are bound to it is right down here at the bottom. As soon as there are proteins that bind to this particular DNA, you'll see these shifts, and that's why it's called a band shift assay or mobility shift assay, where the radioactive DNA doesn't go as far, and the reason it hasn't gone as far is because it has a higher mass. Why does it have a higher mass? Because there's a protein that's associated with it. Now, in this case, we have six different proteins that will give you six different mobility shifts or band shifts in this particular assay, this particular gel. So it's a mixture of six different proteins, again, all of which are going to associate with the DNA. Six is great, but you really care about the individual proteins. So you also want to separate these proteins relative to each other. And that's what's shown over here on the right-hand side, which is separation of this mixture of proteins. So you have a whole mixture of proteins. You try and separate them relative to each other. And this is just showing here, looking at all the proteins that you have, separating them from each other. And we'll look at the separations really try to at the end of the course here. But these are going to have something different about them, say a different size relative to each other. So C2 is bigger than C3, which is bigger than C1, C4, C5, C6, for instance. And each of those, if you now take this part right here, it's going to have mostly C2, a little bit of C3, and C1. That corresponds to here. 
and you see where you have a band shift corresponding to C3, C2, and C1. And using this, you can purify this protein, C2, away from all the other ones and say, okay, it's present just in this little piece right here. It's not present over here. If you're looking for C6, it's going to be present over here in the absence of all these other proteins. Now, why is this so important? As I mentioned before, last time, the number of genes that code for transcription factors or DNA binding proteins can be 10% of your genome, so massive numbers of genes that encode for these things. But the amounts of these proteins are very, very small. So the needle in the haystack is sort of a pretty good analogy here. You're trying to pull out that needle that binds to your favorite piece of DNA. And so this is just one way of doing that. Another way of doing this, and this is probably a much more common way, particularly these days, is what's called affinity chromatography. So now you have a very specific DNA sequence, and in this case it's GGGCCC, and you have a whole mixture of proteins. We'll start over here at step two. We'll get back to step one in just a second here. Um, whole mixture of proteins, we're looking for the red one, and the red one is the one that binds to GGGCCC. So you have this DNA sequence that you attach to a column, some kind of matrix, that will specifically bind to this red, pro this red protein. So you put this mixture, you run it through here, the proteins that don't bind to GGGCCC will come out, all these green ones, and then the ones which bind specifically to your protein are these red ones that are down here at the end. If this were the case and it worked really well, um, you should be able to take a whole mixture of proteins, a whole cell, and you remember our 2D gel that we looked at last time, all those individual spots, which are different proteins and different modifications of each of those proteins. So you've got thousands of different proteins in there, and you're really looking for one or two of them. So it turns out that trying to do this process right at the beginning is very difficult. So usually the way that people do these processes, you take all of the cellular proteins and just find those that bind to DNA first. And so you end up getting rid of all these blue ones, which don't bind to DNA at all, and then you specifically look at these individual proteins right here and put them onto your column. Everyone remember, I know we forgot it because it was the last midterm, um, TF2A, TF2B, TF2C, TF2D, TF2E, F, G, E, H, et cetera. You know where all those letters came from? They came from different fractions coming off one of these gels. So that's where those numbers actually come from. And very many of them isolated in exactly this way. So this works very well for isolating the protein that binds to a specific DNA sequence. But if you're interested in a very, very specific and literally to the individual nucleotide where your particular DNA binds. So going back to that you know, cartoon we had of the crow protein bound as a dimer to DNA. How do we know exactly which nucleotides it was associated with? This is a procedure called DNA footprinting. And the way that this works is you have a piece of DNA that has your sequence in it that your protein binds to. And usually you figure this out by some kind of band shift assay, et cetera. I should have mentioned before, usually these EMSA or band shift assays, they're hundreds of nucleotides long, each of these pieces of DNA. Here, what we're looking at is trying to find down to the individual base or base pair that your DNA um, is, bi or, so your protein is binding to. So the way that you do these experiments is you have a piece of DNA and again, this could often be that same DNA that you have your electrophoretic mobility shift assay. You mix it together with your protein. So now your protein is bound to this piece of DNA. And then you treat it with nucleases. What do nucleases do? Chop up your DNA and chop it, in this particular case, nucleotide by nucleotide. So if you just have a DNA that doesn't have protein on it, it's going to have all of these individual pieces that are all these various different lengths. And this is, again, it's separating from large to small. And no protein around. You see this ladder of different sequences. What happens if you include protein? 
Now you see a region where the nuclease hasn't cut your DNA. If it hasn't cut the DNA, you're not going to see pieces of DNA that are between this length and this length. And that tells you that your protein has sat down right here and is blocking the nuclease from chewing up this particular piece of DNA. And so now, if you know the sequence, and we'll talk about sequencing later on, of your particular DNA, you see where the footprint is because you didn't have nuclease cleavage here. You know what the sequence is. You now know the sequence that your particular DNA binding protein is binding to. And so you can look at, for dyad symmetries and figure out consensus sites, et cetera, from these particular kinds of experiments. So this works great if you have a sequence that, through your band shift assay, um, affinity chromatography, et cetera, you can say, OK, I know that I have a protein that binds to this particular piece of DNA. I'm trying to purify that protein. Sometimes, however, you have a DNA binding protein that you have no idea what it binds to. Say you're sequencing a genome, and you run across a protein that's got all of these cysteines in it that look like it should be a leucine zipper, or not a leucine zipper, sorry, a zinc finger. Um, so cysteine, zinc finger, probably binding to DNA. What the heck is it binding to? And so in this case, yes, you could chop up the whole genome into different pieces and do these electrophoretic mobility shift assays, but if you've got a three billion base pair genome, that's going to be really hard to do. So there are other ways of doing this, and one of those is called the CELEX method, and I've forgotten what this abbreviation stands for. Um, but what you do here is you have your DNA binding protein up here at the top that you have no idea what it binds to. So what you do is you mix this together with all kinds of random sequences, just completely random sequences, and we have now figured out how to synthesize DNA really easily, really quickly. So you can get lots of different pieces of DNA, all of them with different sequences. Then what you do is you let your protein bind to, and it's going to bind to just one of these sequences. You do this, you now separate this protein DNA complex, um, and you can do this with a gel mobility shift assay, um, but you now have to identify the protein. So you're pulling out the protein here. With this protein, now you find the sequence, and it's usually actually sequence says, because when we're looking about consensus sequences, it's not just going to be one sequence, it's going to be a family of sequences that this is bound to. And usually, this extra step, this arrow I added here, is you go through this multiple times, you find binding of your protein to a mixture of DNAs, you separate that mixture again, and eventually you can determine the sequence here which that protein is bound to. And so, again, you start with a random mixture of sequences, find the ones that your protein is bound to, and then you could do a DNA's footprinting, et cetera. So this is one process that can be used. This is great if you have your protein, it's purified, et cetera, but it doesn't really tell you what's happening inside the cell. So to do that, we use a process called chromatin immunoprecipitation. Ugh, what big words. So chromatin we've already talked about. It's the combination of protein plus DNA that you find in any particular cell. And immuno, whenever anybody says immuno in molecular biology, it means antibodies. So you've got an antibody to your favorite protein. And again, you do this when you already know what the protein is that you're trying to look at. You've maybe done a bunch of these experiments, a CELEX experiment. You've done DNAs1 footprinting, but that's all on purified DNA. What's this protein actually interacting with in the cell? So the way that you do this is you start out with your favorite regulatory protein here, and it turns out there are going to be multiple different regulatory proteins, A and B here, and actually, as I say, there are thousands of them. They're all throughout your, um, your genome. But this is now in a particular cell. So now you take these cells, you break those cells open, and you do a chemical treatment. And this is a non-biological treatment, usually formaldehyde, which is a fixation treatment, where you get covalent bond formation between DNA binding proteins and their DNA. 
Now you have these DNA binding proteins stuck to the DNA where they were at that particular time that you stopped whatever was happening here. Then you break open the cells, you chomp this DNA into little pieces, and then what you're interested in is what DNAs are bound to your favorite protein, and in this case, the yellow one. How do you find your favorite protein? This is the immuno part. The antibody that you have to this protein will just bind to your protein and the DNA that it's associated with. You can separate this from all of the other DNA, all of the other proteins. And then you just need to figure out what the sequence is that this protein was actually bound to. And you can do this again chemically, that cross link that you made in the first place between the proteins and the DNA back up here. You can reverse these and you can determine what the sequence is of this particular protein. There are a number of different ways of figuring out this sequence. <clears throat> the original one was using the polymerase chain reaction. Who does that anymore? We've got really good sequencers. So pretty much everyone these days does something called a chip seek. Well, what the heck is a chip seek? So chip is just chromatin immunoprecipitation. Again, us molecular biologists love to abbreviate things. So chip is the chromatin immunoprecipitation. And then just sequence all the DNAs that this protein is associated with inside the cell. An older technique is this chip to chip mechanism. So that second chip is a microarray. And the microarray is just all the genes in your genome and individual little spots of them that you have on a microscope slide. Practically nobody does this anymore because sequencing has become so easy. So I probably just put a big X through here and just say chip seek um, because you now just sequence all of these DNAs. And people have done this now actually even with nucleosomes. So you can look at nucleosomes and all the nucleosome sequences um, that are things that are bound to nucleosomes and just map those throughout the whole genome of the cell. Um, people have done this with promoters and RNA polymerase. Where does the RNA polymerase sit in the cell at any particular given time? Really amazing amounts of data. Yeah? Um, so you were mentioning that you can use like, antibodies to actually purify the protein DNA fragments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, this is a question about sort of how physically this is actually done. Uh, and the, I don't want to get into too many of the details, but basically it's usually an immobilized antibody that you're using or an immobilized secondary antibody. Um, so, but it's, it's a way of just isolating that particular specific antibody antigen interaction, in this case, your favorite protein, um, with that particular antibody interaction. And these are almost always going to be protein antibodies. Um, you can also get antibodies to DNA, but that's a totally different story. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's usually immobilized antibody in some way. Okay, all good on techniques? Yes, no, want more time? Give you a second to read this before I turn it on. You know the DNA sequence that a transcriptional regulator binds to, but not the protein. Which of the following methods would be the best to isolate the protein? EMSA, DNA affinity chromatography, DNA footprinting, cell X, or chromatin immunoprecipitation. Ready? Go. That was quick. <laughs> Again, vote early, vote often. Still aiming for 100% here, right? We're still not at 100%. We're still working on it. But yes, in terms of purification, the affinity chromatography is the best way to go. So the answer is B. 
Okay, so now you know the sequence that your protein binds to, you know what that protein is, you know where it's binding inside the cell. Now we can actually figure out what the heck it's doing. And so this brings us to bacterial transcriptional regulation. We'll talk more about eukaryotic transcriptional regulation. Uh, when's my next lecture? Friday? Uh, so <clears throat> the first of these is what you see in bacteria. And again, the reason we're talking about bacteria first is they're a lot more straightforward in terms of understanding, but the same principles are going to apply in eukaryotic systems as well, with a couple of exceptions. One of those is in bacteria, we have polycystronic mRNAs. Polycystronic means we've got multiple completely different proteins being made on one RNA. This turns out to be incredibly efficient because it means you can regulate transcriptional initiation at one point for multiple different genes. And so here we have the example of the tryptophan operon. The tryptophan operon is a stretch of DNA which gets transcribed into RNA, which encodes all of the enzymes that are required for tryptophan biosynthesis. And as all of you remember from your structures of amino acids, tryptophan is pretty darn complicated. It's the, one of the craziest in terms of the different amino acids and needs lots of different proteins in order to make it. Um, because it needs lots of different proteins to make it, it's actually pretty energy intensive to make all of these proteins to make this one individual amino acid. So that in individual amino acid is around, then why make all of these extra proteins? So the regulation here is in the presence of the product that you're trying to make, there's no reason at all to make all of these proteins. In the absence, you do need tryptophan. It's one of the essential amino acids. So you need to make all of these proteins in order to make that particular amino acid. So <clears throat> the way the trip operon works in E. coli, you have a promoter, all of the different genes which are important for tryptophan biosynthesis, and then this thing that we haven't talked about yet, which is the operator. And the operator is the sequence that is the important one for regulation of this particular operon. So the operon are all of these genes that are regulated together. The operator is what's regulating this particular <clears throat> operon. And the operon, again, is just all these multiple sequences, which are going to call these multiple proteins here. So how does this work? It has to do with the promoter and how you get transcription taking place in bacteria. And transcription in bacteria, hopefully as Dr. Bartlett talked about, it's all about promoter binding. And the same thing is true for transcription in eukaryotes as well. It's about binding to the promoter. If you've got your RNA polymerase that binds to the promoter, there's open complex formation, there's abortive initiation. But basically, polymerase binds to the promoter, you'll get transcription. If the polymerase doesn't bind to the promoter, you're not going to get transcription. So if you zoom into the promoter here, classic bacterial promoter, minus 10, minus 35, what interacts with these sequences? Sigma factor, exactly. So sigma factor will interact with these in the presence of the RNA polymerase. If you have nothing associated with the operator, now you get transcription that starts here, you're perfectly happy. If, however, you have some regulatory protein that binds to the operator, which is right between the minus 10 and minus 35, the holoenzyme, the sigma factor plus the rest of the polymerase, can't bind. So how is this regulated? Well, it's regulated dependent on the presence or absence of tryptophan. So remember, if you don't have tryptophan around, you need to make all of these enzymes to make tryptophan. If you do have tryptophan around, you don't want to make them at all. So here we have the presence of tryptophan, the repressor binds to DNA and blocks the RNA polymerase from binding. In the absence of tryptophan, you don't want to bind here because you're going to need to transcribe all of these genes. How does this work? It works through the allosteric change, and we talked briefly about allosteric. It's binding in one part of the protein that causes a change in the structure in a different part of the protein. So for the trip repressor, we have in the presence of tryptophan, it changes the structure. So here's the absence of tryptophan, the presence of tryptophan, and all that it does is it moves these alpha helices, which are part of what? What did we talk about right at the beginning of lecture today? 
Helix turn helix, exactly. So these are helix turn helices that are offset relative to the adjacent major grooves. And if they're offset relative to the adjacent major grooves, again, why 3.4 nanometers is important, um, then they're not going to bind to DNA. In the presence of tryptophan, these move and now can bind to DNA. So presence of tryptophan binds, blocks the binding of the RNA polymerase. This is a classic example of what's called negative regulation. So binding by a protein blocks the association of the polymerase from binding to that particular promoter. Um, and for a long time, this was thought to be the only kind of regulation that happened in bacteria and actually only kind of transcriptional regulation at all. So here, negative regulation is a repressor that is going to bind to the promoter and prevent transcription. Now, you can have two different kinds of repressors. You can have a repressor like the trip repressor, which when you have tryptophan around, the trip repressor will bind. You also have examples, and we'll talk about this on Friday, I think, at this rate, um, where you have a repressor that bounds in the absence of a ligand. So this is going to be a one different conditions, different conditions that the cell is growing in. You'll want to have binding in the presence of a ligand, like trip, binding in the absence, as we'll see later for lactose, as something gets, gets broken down. So this was regulation. And this was thought to be the only kind of regulation that happens. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Jacques Monod and uh, uh, Monod Jacob, Francois Jacob, um, this was the only kind of mechanism that happened in terms of transcriptional regulation. And they were so convinced of this that when one of my professors from graduate school gave one of his very first talks at a scientific meeting um, and said, I think there may be some evidence for positive regulation, apparently... At that point, um, Jacques Monod, who had just gotten the Nobel Prize, was sitting in the front row and said, eh, there's no such thing as positive regulation, and stormed out of the room. <laughs> so, wonderful story here. But it uh, turns out that this professor of mine was actually right, and Jacques Monod was wrong, um, that there was positive regulation. All the positive regulation is, is that instead of blocking binding, of the polymerase to a particular promoter, actually stimulating binding of the polymerase to a particular promoter. And that stimulation, again, can happen through one of these regulator proteins, and these regulator proteins, usually in the presence or absence of a ligand, will lead to binding in the absence of ligand or binding in the presence of ligand here. And we'll see some of those examples later on, particularly involved with this catabolite activator protein or CMP response protein. People call them different names, different researchers give them different names just to make things really confusing for us. So we'll look at a combination of those things when we talk about these on Friday.